worthy of our praise. Go ahead and grab a seat for just a second. Good morning and welcome to The Bridge. It is amazing to have you with us. If you're newer with us, a big welcome to you. My name is Chris and I uh, have the honor and privilege of serving on staff here. If you are newer with us, uh, whether in person or online, uh, we want to get to know you a little bit. And the best way to do that if you're online is to go to bridgechurches.ca and right on their main page, you will see a new here button. We'd love for you to click that uh, so we can get to know you a little bit. We always love to know who's on the other side of the screen. Uh, If you're in person with us, though, we actually have a new here kiosk in the lobby. And if you haven't done so yet, we have one of our amazing guest service team members there ready and willing and excited uh, to get to know you, to say hello, as well as give you a gift as well, uh, just to say thank you so much for spending an hour of your Sunday with us. We know there's a lot of places you could be on a day like today, especially as the weather's warming up, uh, but we are so glad that you are here with us. Just before we get into a little bit more sitting, I want to read a a passage um, from Psalms, Psalm 100. It says this, it says, Shout shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him, sinning with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. So let's do that this morning. I'm going to stand up and sing along with the band.
Blushing over every day God of mercy, please come rescue me I am longing for your voice Gentle whispers in the noise Father, tell me Shake the mountains, break the walls apart, open the heavens, almighty God you are, overcomer, defender of my heart, by your power. ahead and grab a seat. Well, if you haven't heard yet, this Saturday is the IF conference. That is our women's conference. Many of you signed up. I think we got about 50 ladies signed up already for that. Uh, but it is going to be a great event. All of our the ladies in our small group, I think, are going. Our circle are going. Uh, it's going to be a great time. We're going to video feed in the, the speakers. Um, they have a live band. There's going to be breakfast, snacks throughout the day. There's some gifts and some prizes and all sorts of wonderful things. And uh, all for only $25. So if you have been thinking about it, I've heard a lot of people going, oh yeah, I need to sign up for that. Well, it's Saturday. 
So it's coming up. So Wednesday is the deadline to sign up. So if you have not done so yet, please do so. You can go to the events page on our website. You'll see that logo, and you can sign up for it. It's going to be a great time uh, just to be uh, encouraged and challenged and uh, to, to spend some time with some, some fellow women as well. It's going to be a good time. So hope you have, uh, have signed up. But if you have not, please do so. Uh, I think you'll be, uh, it'll be well worth uh, your time. So make sure you sign up um, by Wednesday. You won't want to miss it. All right. So we kicked off last week. We kicked off the series called Hot Messes. We learned that we're all hot messes. Okay, maybe we didn't learn it, but we admitted that we're all hot messes. And what we talked about last week is just this idea that, you know what? It's really the, the Easter message that Jesus gave his life for the messes in our life. And it was a great way to kick it off. And I know a lot of you are intrigued about what the rest of the series is going to hold. So let's get into week two right now. Check out the screen. All right. Uh, wow, it's good to be with you today. Uh, listen, um, if you're anything like me, if you're anything like me, do you think spring has sprung? No. Okay. I, I'm believing, I'm hoping, I'm trusting uh, that not only does he break strongholds, but he breaks winter. And I believe that spring is here to stay because this last week was a mess. It was silly. It was foolish, borderline stupid to wake up. I thought it was over. I wore shorts to get groceries one day and the next day back in winter boots. And I'm just, I'm over it. I'm done with it. And so I'm believing that spring is here to stay. And, and I'm excited about that. Now, speaking of messes, as Chris said last week, we began this series called Hot Mess. And, and really the whole point of this series is that no matter what you do or don't believe, whether you would call yourself a Christian or not, you know, been going to church most of, if not all your life, uh, whether you're kicking the tires on the faith thing, no matter how old you are, no matter how young you are, no matter where you are in your faith journey or just your life journey, one of the things that we all have in common is I think that all of us can admit and acknowledge that life is messy. Isn't that true? Life is just messy. Sometimes we create the mess that we're in. Sometimes we inherit the mess that we're in. Sometimes it's like this week, you just wake up in the morning and it's a mess outside. You wake up, it's a mess in life. You don't know how it happened. You don't know what caused it to happen. You just know you're in a mess, right? And sometimes it's a combination of all those three. It's we make them, we inherit them, and it just happens. But life is just messy. And the good news, or at least one of the reasons we're talking about this in this series, is that it's actually the mess that brings us together today. The mess, the mess in the world, the mess in our lives is what brings us together because it's in those moments of mess. It's in those moments we find ourselves in a mess that we all find ourselves searching for the same things. Isn't that true? We find ourselves searching for answers. We find ourselves searching for hope, searching for help. For some of us, it's in the mess that we find ourselves searching for God. It's the mess that brings us together today. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that just in a few minutes. But before we do that, I thought to kind of jump in and because and it's early and I want to make sure you're with me. And, and I just thought it'd be fun if I told you a story about a time in my life where I made a mess in my life. Specifically, it was a time in my life where I literally made a hot mess. Um, I was 11 years old. Okay, 11 years old, and, and I've talked about this before, but I grew up in a single parent household. Okay, so my mom, she raised my brother and I. I don't know how she made it through. I don't know how she survived. She's still with us. I, I don't know. She, she, she was an amazing woman. And, and when my father, when I was four, my father left our family. And so my mom began this journey of single parenthood and 
She's just an amazing woman. She's my hero. And, and growing up, she, she did so much for us. And, and as, a, as a young kid, what my mom did, um, her job, she was actually a private health care provider. She had a nursing background and she went into private home health care. And she, most of the time, she took care of people who were you know, elderly and, 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 in, and specifically, uh, she dealt in palliative care. And so my mom, um, not only is an incredible woman, but she is gifted, like, I mean, gifted in this way and in this area. Like her, her ability to come alongside people at that stage and at that part of their journey, it just, it's always amazed me. Um, she's just so empathetic and she's just so caring and so giving. And, uh, and, and, and she's like that with people in that stage of their life. She wasn't always like that with us in our childhood. But the point is, um, <laughs> you get the point though. I, I really admire her. And, and so one of the things that was like growing up in that kind of environment and with the work that she did and, and kind of the, the hours that she had to work was I at a very young age kind of had to grow up quickly. Um, I, I know that's take that with a grain of salt, right? But I, I did. I had to kind of mature quickly. I had to take care of my brother and myself. We had to, my mom was always at work. She needed to work as much as she could to provide for us. And so many times her job would actually require her to be uh, working night shifts. She would stay all night at, at a certain person's home to care for them and make sure they were okay. And so that left my brother and I at home alone. So I was 11 and I was looking after my brother. And, and I, at a young age, developed an awareness of what my mom was doing and what it was taking from her and, and costing her. Like she, you know, she would work a lot of hours. She would work nights and then she would come home. She'd be exhausted. And so I tried to help out as much as I could. I took care of my brother. I tried to take care of the house, tried to keep things clean and tidy as best. I mean, how can an 11 year old do that? Well, but I did it to the best of my ability. And, um, and as I got at that stage in my life, I, I really started to, to want to do things for my mom. And so one night it was a Friday night and I could remember it was a Friday night because I remembered that the next morning I had a baseball tournament. And so I was, it was up late Friday night. I was tidying things up. I was getting things ready because I knew mom was coming home early and I wanted to make sure when she walked in that she could just kind of come in and, and relax. And so before I went to bed, I just got this crazy idea. It was Friday night. It was late at night. And I thought, I'm going to make my mom some cookies. I mean, because who doesn't want to come home from the night shift and find a plate of cookies on the table? I mean, she probably wanted some sleep. I should have made her bed, but I decided to make her some cookies. And I, I, I love baking. I, I love it today. And I loved it then. Um, I grew up baking with my grandmother. Um, we called her Nanny, and, and Nanny loved to bake. She would bake, not for herself, but oftentimes she would bake for other people. She would just make things and then go take it to them and as a way to visit, and, and, uh, and so I loved doing that with her and sitting on the stool and baking with her and, and the stories she would tell as we baked together. It was awesome, my fondest memories, and she would get out her recipe box and sit it on the thing, and what should we make today, Scott? And, and she, we would do that together, and, and so this Friday night, unfortunately, I didn't have Nanny, and I didn't have her recipe box. So what I did is I went looking for recipes in our house. And, and finally I found, I stumbled upon a recipe for peanut butter cookies, which is one of my favorites. I love peanut butter cookies. I know not everybody likes them. Not everybody can eat them. But anyways, the point is I like them. And so I thought, well, maybe my mom will like them. And so I started making these peanut butter cookies. Now, um, again, my grandmother wasn't with me, so I didn't have her proficiency in the kitchen and I didn't have uh, her cleanliness in the kitchen. Okay, so, so I started getting out everything. I mean, like all the ingredients and every cupboard was open and turning things and pulling out, you know, cookie sheets and getting uh, mixing bowls and everything to stir. And I had everything going around and just, just and, and, and all of a sudden the kitchen that I had just cleaned up moments ago was all of a sudden just getting cluttered and full of stuff. Everything was everywhere. Countertops were full and there was just stuff everywhere and started making these things and, and started putting in all the ingredients and stirring it up and getting everything ready. And then I got to the point, you know how it is if you've baked before, um, it was time to preheat the oven. And, and so I got the oven going and, and I know, or I knew that at this stage of baking, that my cookie dough was to be rolled into balls, put on the cookie sheets, and then pressed down with a fork dipped in hot water, right? Now, okay, that's what you do, or at least what we did. And, and so I was getting ready, to, I was ready to do that, but unfortunately, for some reason, um, my cookie dough could not be rolled in to a ball because my cookie dough was not dough. It was more like cookie soup. Um, I, don't, I don't know what happened. And so I was like, what is something, uh, something's wrong. And so um, I did what maybe you would do in this situation. I was like, it needs more flour. And so I just started adding flour thinking, I got to thicken this up. There's something wrong with the dough. I can't, it, it's supposed to be rolled into a ball and it's just soup. And then all of a sudden there was more flour. And, and I don't know, there's not a really clean way to add flour, is there? Just flour seems to just get 
it's like dust. It just gets everywhere. It gets on everything. I had flour <laughs> everywhere. And, and so it's like, like I'm pouring this in, I'm stirring it up, stirring it up, stirring it up. And it's not, it's not doing what it's supposed to do. Like it's not turning into rollable dough. So then it kind of dawned on me, well, maybe it's the recipe because it certainly can't be anything I'm doing wrong. It has to be the recipe. Maybe the recipe is for like, it's not like crunchy, like crispy peanut butter cookies like my grandmother makes. It's actually like maybe those, you know, cake-like um, cookies. And I was like, oh, okay, maybe it's just a different recipe. And so then it hit me, well, what I need to do now um, is figure out, I got to get these onto the cookie sheet. So I took the big spoon and I started like trying to ch- like scoop the, the, the soup onto the, the cookie sheet. And, and there's, again, there's no neat way to do that. And so I'm like scooping it all out and the oven's getting hot and I'm getting frustrated. I'm like, this is just, this is just a mess. Right. And then I was like, oh, wait a minute. I know. I went and got the soup ladle. And then I started soup ladling the soup onto the cookie sheets. And again, you start flipping that and there's stuff flipping this way and flipping that way and flipping onto me. And it's all over the table. It's all over the floor. It's everywhere. It's on the kitchen chair, just everywhere. And so then I start looking for like things to wipe it up. And I used all the dish towels and we ran out of dish towels. And then I used the paper towels and then we're at a paper towel. So then I went and got toilet paper and I'm wiping off all this stuff with toilet paper, throwing it in the garden. Like there's just stuff everywhere. And finally, I'm ready to put the cookie sheets into the oven and I open up the oven. It's ready to go throw the things in there. And uh, this is awesome. I turned on the, the light on the, on the, the stove or the oven and, and kind of like looked in, you know, that little window and um, they, they give you to look in and I'm watching this and it's like, okay, we're, we're good to go. And so I kind of walked away for a minute and then I kind of came back and I looked in and, and it... <laughs> It was, it, was like, it was like watching like one of those really cheesy 90s sci-fi movies. It was like there was like individual like pancake cookie looking things and, and the heat, like they started to like grow into each other. Like it was like the, and it just kind of soaked into each other. And then, and then it started like, it was like, it was like gremlins. It's like they started bubbling and it was like, and this stuff, this like big thing started plopping all over the place and the stuff started splattering and started oozing over the top of the cookie sheet. And now it's cooking into the oven. And then I'm like, oh, this is not good. This is not good. And I'm trying, and, and, and I'm 11 years old, right? Like I'm, I'm clearly not as sophisticated as I am today. And, <laughs> And I'm, and I'm thinking to myself, what am I going to, what am I, what do I do with this? Like, I have no idea. Like, it's going to eat our house. Like, I, this thing is growing. I don't know what we're going to do. And so I was like, what, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? I was like, I got to get it out. I got to, I got to, got to get it out of there. So I turned off the oven and I opened the door. And as I opened the door, the smoke came out uh, and it's turned on the fire alarm. And now there's like dogs barking and wolves howling. And like, there's just, I'm like, what's, go- what's going on? I, I literally, I unhooked the phone because I was scared scared that my mom was going to find out that someone is going to call her. Like it's in the middle of the night, like what's going on? And, and so it's literally a hot mess. Okay. And I'm 11 years old. And so I did what any 11 year old boy would do in that situation. I've got stuff everywhere. The sink is full. The garbage can's full. The floor is covered. The table is covered. The counters are, every, it's just a mess. So I did what any 11 year old boy would do in that situation. I went to bed. <laughs> I did. I went to bed, laid in my bed, closed my eyes, and no sooner did I fall asleep than my eyes were open to the horrific screams of my mother walking into our house at six in the morning and seeing what looked like a baking accident happened in our house. And I hear this, Scar! like, you know, didn't blame my brother. No, no calls my name. I come running out and it's like, I got to deliver. So I put on the water. Works. Mom, I'm so sorry. I love you. And I just want to see tears coming down my face. And she's like, Scott, what happened? What, what, she couldn't even get, what happened? And I'm like, I love you. I wanted to make you some cookies. You worked so hard. I just want to see, I made you some peanut butter cookies because they're your favorite. They're not her favorite, but I just want to give it. And my mom, like, I was like, One of two things could have happened in that moment. Like she gave me life. She could have taken it away. Um, I didn't know what, I didn't know what to expect. And my mom kind of does what only she can do. She gets this little grin on the side of her face and she's kind of shook her head. She walked over to me and she put her arm around me and I was kind of flinched a little bit. And then she, she says, honey, um, that's so sweet. But, and then she points on the refrigerator. There's a, there's a, there's a little sheet of paper on the refrigerator. She said, honey, we don't even have peanut butter. She showed me the grocery list. We didn't have peanut. I don't know how I was making peanut butter cookies. We didn't even have peanut butter in the house. Like literally, what was I doing? It's a hot mess. And so we spent the morning together 
after her working the night shift and we cleaned the kitchen together. Now listen, here's why I tell you that story. Um, here's why I tell you that story. Some of you are like, what, what in the world? You gained a new appreciation from my mom. No, the reason I tell you this story um, is this. I wanna talk to the group of you who today, that, that story is kind of a picture of your life right now. That, that you're in a mess and you have no idea if it can ever be cleaned up. Like you're in a mess and you would, say, you would say, Scott, look, I look good on the outside, but I am a hot mess. Like I'm somewhat functional, but there is a disaster, a literal disaster going on in my life. This mess, is, this is a mess that's so big. You know, you're like, I don't know. I don't even know where to begin. Like Scott, the mess is so big. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to fix this. I don't even know if this could ever be cleaned up. This is a mess that if you're honest with yourself, this is a mess that's your fault. You, 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 you didn't listen to somebody. You ignored some really good advice. You ignored the advice of your parents. You, you ignored your friends. You ignored the people that were telling you the truth. For some of you, you, you ignored God that you maybe grew up in church or heard the scriptures or you heard people talk about certain things in different aspects and what God might have to say about certain things in our life and you just, you, you didn't listen. For some of you, you maybe didn't have that, but you ignored yourself. You ignored your conscience. There was something in you that said, I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't call him. I shouldn't go in there, but you went ahead and you did it anyway and now you're in a mess and it's your fault. If you're, that's you, I'm so glad that you're here today. And, and, and I want to talk to you. You say, Scott, I've got a mess going on in my life and I have no idea what to do about it. And see, it's the mess that brings us together today. It's the mess that brings us to the place where we kind of looking around and looking up and we're asking questions and we're searching for hope and we're searching for help and we're searching for answers. It's the mess that brings us together today. And the good news is that mess, the mess that brings us together is actually the mess that brought God near. That, the mess that brings us together is the mess that got brought God near, that your mess could, has the potential to bring God near to you. That your mess, the mess that you're in right now, has the potential to bring God to you in a way that you have never experienced or discovered God before. Last week, we looked at a number of people on Easter Sunday. We looked at a number of different people who Jesus encountered who had made a mess, not only of their lives and in their lives, but they had, he, they had made a mess of other people's lives in the process. And we found that Jesus not only embraced, embraced them, but he embraced them in the midst of their mess. And then he called them. He called them to something more. He called them to something better. He called them to something greater. That Jesus embraced people at the place and at the point of their mess, and he delivered them from their mess. And see, the, the beautiful thing is, and what we're going to talk about today, is the same Jesus who did that for those people all those years ago desires to do and be that very same thing in your life today. That the clearest, the purest picture we have of who God is, is Jesus. If you want to know what God is like, just look to Jesus. If you want to know what God thinks, listen to the words of Jesus. Read the words of Jesus. If you want to know how God responds, watch how Jesus responds. Jesus came to reveal the Father. He said, I've come to point people to the Father. I and the, fa and the Father are one. And you can know what God is like by watching me. And that same Jesus, the Son of God, embraced people as a mess, as a hot mess, not after they got their mess figured out and cleaned up, but he embraced them in the midst of their mess and he delivered them from their mess. That Jesus invited messy people, get this, Jesus invited messy people to follow him while they were still a mess. And as a byproduct of following them, he called them away from, he led them out of and away from their mess. In fact, right after the encounter that Jesus had with this woman, we talked about last week, this woman at the Temple Mount who was dragged before him and threw down in front of him, right after the interaction that Jesus had with this woman who was accused of adultery, right after that moment, John, the gospel writer John tells us, right after this, John quotes Jesus who said this. He said, I, this is Jesus speaking, I am the light of the world. That's Jesus. He's saying, I am the light of the world. I can and I will show you the way forward. I'll show you the way out of this mess. I can't. I will show you the way forward. I will show you the way out of your mess. And you see, we, when we think of Jesus as the light of the world, or when we talk about Jesus being the light, we think, you know, it's like a Christmas kind of thing to say. But what that means for you today, if you're in a mess right now in your life, what that means is you are in a dark place and you need a light that you are in the midst of a mess and you need to find the way out. And Jesus says, I am that person. 
I am the light. And then he goes on and he says, whoever, whoever follows me, whoever means whoever, whoever follows me. And I want to pause right here and I want to stop. I want you to think about this for a moment and I want you to be honest, okay? I want you to be honest with yourself. Isn't this true? Isn't it true that you were not following Jesus when you made a mess of your life? Isn't it true that you were not following Jesus when you made a mess in your life? I'm not saying that you didn't believe in Jesus, but you were not following Jesus. You did not follow Jesus into your mess. See, not only did you ignore your conscience, not only did you ignore somebody's wise advice, but for some of us, you ignored God. Now, for some of us, we ignored God out of ignorance. We had no idea what God had said about this area or this issue in my life. We just kind of went with our heart and we went with our gut and we went with what felt right in the moment. But for others of us, if you grew up in church or you've been around church and you heard certain things talked about and you knew what the Bible says about this or what God has to say about that, you knew what it said. You knew what he's asked us to do or not to do and you went ahead and did the opposite, right? Right? You were not following Jesus when you got into the mess that you're in. In fact, what you did is you convinced yourself, I mean, what's up with this? You talked yourself into the worst decisions that you've ever made. You knew that it was wrong, and for some reason, you just went ahead and did it anyway, and now you're in a mess, and it's your fault. And Jesus says, Jesus says, I am the light of the world And I have come into the world not to condemn the world. I have come into the world as a light. And so you didn't follow me into this mess, but I'm inviting you to follow me out of this mess. I'm inviting you to follow me. I am the light of the world. See, the only way that you can get out of a dark place is to follow the light. And Jesus says, that's exactly who I am. And I'm not condemning you for your mess. I'm not looking at your face and calling you out. And why did you do that? You knew better. You like, it's none of that. It's I'm embracing you as a hot mess in the midst of your mess. Not after you get it all figured out and cleaned up. Just as my mom put her arm around me, your heavenly father puts his arm around you and says, I'm embracing you as a mess in the mess. And as you follow me, I will lead you out of and away from your mess. He says, I am the light of the world. He goes on and he gives us this promise. He says, whoever follows me, whoever follows me will never, that's a pretty strong word, will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, listen, I know what you want. And the reason and the way I know what you want is because you want what I want when I find myself in a mess, right? I understand that. I know what you want. You know what you want? You want CAA, right? You, you, you want to pick up the phone. You, you, who are you going to call? Ghostbusters, right? Like we want to pick up the phone. We want to call somebody who's going to show up and fix the mess, clean up the mess. We want to do that one quick thing. We want the silver bullet. We want the magic pill that's all of a sudden going to clean this up. We want to shake their hand. Thank you so much for coming. And next time this happens, I'll be sure to call you back, right? And send them on their way and go back to your life and do your own thing. That's what we want, isn't it? But is that how life works? No, and that's not how our heavenly father works. And do you know why your heavenly father does not work that way? It's because he wants more for you than just to come alongside you and fix your problems and clean up your messes. And do you know why that is? It's because your heavenly father is a heavenly father. And do you know what every good father wants with and from their children? A relationship a relationship. And do you know what matters most to a good father? It matters more than behavior. What matters most to a good father is relationship. I would rather have imperfect children who love me rather than perfect children who don't care anything about me. And that thing that's in me as an earthly father is a reflection of the heart of our heavenly father. Yes, he cares about your behavior, but that is not what is most important to him. Do you know what is most important to him? What's most important to your heavenly father is an intimate relationship with you made possible through the person who made that relationship possible, his son, Jesus Christ. And we say, I want to make a call. I want somebody to show up. I want to give somebody the opportunity to just clean this up for me so that I can get back to life and shake their hand and say, I'll see you next time we've got the issue. That's what we want. But your heavenly father, our heavenly father wants more for you than that. 
Your heavenly father wants a relationship with you and he's invited you to follow him. And we say that all the time, but what does that even mean? What does it mean to follow him? What does that mean? Follow Jesus, follow God. What does that mean? Well, the answer to that question is our mission as a church. We say it all the time that we want to lead people of all ages in a growing relationship with Jesus because that's what it is. It is a relationship. It is a journey of discovery. It is a process. It's daily, day by day, discovering what it means, what the implications are of following him. And as we unearth and as we discover these things that God has said through the scriptures, our answer is yes, and we follow him. It's a journey. It's a process. It's not a magic prayer. It's not a silver bullet. It's an intimate relationship over time. And Jesus himself talked about this in the best way possible in his sermon, not mine, but in his, the most iconic sermon, the greatest sermon ever preached. It's referred to as the Sermon on the Mount because there were so many people there that Jesus had to go up on the side of a mountain to speak so he could be seen and he could be heard. And here's what he said about this very thing. He said, everyone, again, he's so inclusive. He says, everyone, everyone who hears these words of mine, he's just preached He's just shared words. He said a lot, a lot of truth. And he says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice will end up in a mess. That's not quite what he said, but actually what he said is, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Following Jesus begins with this acknowledgement and it requires a lot of, of humility. Following Jesus begins with this declaration, I have built my life, I have built my house on the sand, and now I'm reaping what I've sown. I, I, I've built my life, I've built my house, I've built my marriage, I've built my dating relationships, I've built my finances, I've, been, I've built my academic pursuits and my career objectives, I've built my life and my morality and my worldview, I've built this area of my life on something that doesn't stand, something that doesn't last, and now that I discovered that it doesn't last and it's falling apart around me, I realize I need you. You see, so often as people who claim to be Christians and followers of Jesus, we seek the hand of God, not the face of God. We seek God as what can I get from you? What can you do for me? Instead of seeking his face for who he is. We get to that point where like, God, I realize I've built my life on something that doesn't work, that doesn't last. And I know I've tended to treat you like CAA, but I need you. I need you. Following Jesus begins with that declaration. And then Jesus would contrast that and he would say, you know what? There's people who build their life on, on the sand, something that doesn't last. But he says, whoever, he goes on and he says, whoever, therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice for the person who says, my answer is yes. I don't even know what you're gonna ask me to do. I don't even know what you're gonna say about this area or this issue in my life. But my answer in advance is yes. I have pre-decided that I'm going to follow you. I have pre-decided that my answer is yes. And since I've pre-decided that I'm going to say yes, because I've pre-decided that I'm gonna follow you as you reveal to me what it is you would have for me, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm not gonna hear what you have to say and then go compare that to some other people to see what they might say or take other things into consideration. I'm not gonna seek other opinions or other perspectives. I have decided, I have pre-decided that my answer is yes. I'm surrendering my life. I'm surrendering my decision-making abilities to you. My answer is yes. What would you say? Because I've already decided that whatever you say is exactly what I am going to do. And for the person who says that, in fact, he says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man or a wise woman who built his house on the rock. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing that we miss. And here's the thing there's no shortcut for. It's the key word in this passage, and it's the word built, built. This is a process. This is not a magic pill. This is not a silver bullet. It is not a magic prayer. It is a process. Built my life. I'm going to build my life. There are no quick fixes, and you're smart. You know this. 
The mess that you made, the mess that you inherited, the mess that you're in, you know there's no quick fix. And even if there was, would you want it? Because if, if there's a quick fix, you know what's gonna happen? You're gonna end up right back in the same situation that you were in before, right? Because how many times have we seen that play out? How many parents have you watched bail out their kids and then the next thing you know, you turn around, their kids are right back in the same predicament? Why? Because your heavenly father is a perfect heavenly father and he wants more for you than just to come alongside you and sweep it under the rug or clean up your mess. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. I'm the light for the world. I have come into the world not to condemn it, but be a light for it. And I want you to follow me. Don't ask me to follow you. I want you to follow me. I want you to determine before you move, before you, I want you to determine that my answer is yes as I discover what you have for me and where you're taking me and where you're leading me. And as a byproduct of me following you, you are going to lead me away from my mess. He says, I'm the light of the world. So listen, because I'm the light of the world, I want you to begin. I want you to begin wherever you are, whatever the mess is right now, I want you to begin to build your life, to begin to build your marriage, to begin to build your family, your parenting, to begin to build your financial portfolio, to begin your, you know, your career aspirations and, and your academic pursuits. I want you to build your life, every single area of your life. I want you to build your life around my words, around my teaching. And if you do, as you do, I will lead you out of, I will lead you away from your mess. This is what he says. Therefore, everyone, go back, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man or woman who built his house on the rock and the rain came down. Some of you could sing the song. The streams rose, it sounds like a country song, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall. Why? Why? Because it had its foundation on the rock. It had its foundation on something firm, on something stable, on something strong, on something that will last. So here's the bottom line for today. And this is the thing, this is the thing that I, I don't want you to miss. I know that not every one of you is going to respond to this and that's okay, but you need to hear it anyway, okay? You need to hear it anyway. This is the bottom line. You cannot, you can't pray your way out of a mess that you behaved your way into. You just can't. You just can't. You can't pray your way out of a mess that you behaved your way into. There's no magic pill. There's no silver bullet. There, there, there's no magic words. There's no, there's no magic prayer. And it's not because God doesn't care. And it's not because God doesn't love you. In fact, God loves us so much that 2,000 years ago, he shone a light into the world that was so bright that if you had followed it, you would have avoided the mess that you're in right now. That if someone else had followed it, it may have caused you to avoid the mess that you're in right now. The mess that you're in right now could have been avoided. You stepped into what you're stepping into not because you're following Jesus. You stepped into what you stepped into because you followed somebody or something else. And God doesn't condemn you for that. God embraces you at that place, but he refuses to leave you there, God invites you to follow his son out. You can't, believe me, I've tried. You can't, you can't pray your way out of a mess that you behaved your way into, but you can follow your way out. You can follow your way out of a mess that you behaved your way into. I know, because I did. You can follow your way out, and listen, your heavenly father, your heavenly father invites you to follow him. He's not offended by you. He does not condemn you. In fact, he sees your mess as an opportunity to invite him in. And we know this is true because this is who Jesus is. And this is what Jesus continually did. Time after time after time after time, Jesus embraced people as a mess in the midst of their mess. And then he asked them to follow him and he delivered them from their mess. And see, another reason we know this is true, and I can't prove this, but as I, as I say what I'm about to say, there's going to be some people in, in this room, and maybe this is true for some of you at home, wherever, whoever you're with, 
But as I say what I'm about to say, there are going to be some people in this room who are going to start to nod. In fact, if this is true, what I'm about to say, if this is true for you, I want you to nod, okay? Um, and, 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 you know, some people nod all the time when I'm preaching. I, I really like those people. Some, <laughs> some people nod off when I'm preaching. That's a whole other thing. But, uh, but, but, you know, and some of you grew up in a church, have a church background where people said amen a lot. And, and as I'm about to say, what I'm about to say, if this is true for you, maybe you could say amen. And I want you to. I want everybody to, to get involved in this. And here's why. Because there's people around you right now, there might be somebody sitting right beside you right now who does not believe and isn't going to believe what I'm about to say and they need to know that this is true, okay? The reason we know, the reason we know that Jesus embraces people as a hot mess in the midst of their mess and invites them to follow him and he delivers them from their mess is because this room is full and I don't know if your room at home is full, but this room is full. These chairs are full of men and women whose story goes something like this. I messed up, I gave up, I looked up, God showed up. Anybody? Is that your story? Yeah. I messed up, I gave up, I looked up, God showed up. See, this isn't preacher talk, right? This isn't like, oh, he's supposed to say that. Like we pay him to say that, right? This isn't just, this isn't just that. This isn't just that 2,000 years ago, Jesus interacted with some crazy people who you know, he, he embraced and made better. No, he's still doing that today. He's still doing that today. We are not perfect people who have never messed up. We are all hot messes who have been redeemed from our mess. And we are not redeemed because we said some magic prayer at night before we went to bed. We are redeemed because of who Jesus is and what Jesus Christ has done. And because he invites us to follow him and he shows us and teaches us what it looks like and what it means to follow him. That right now you're around people who would say, once upon a time I messed up and it was so bad and the mess was so big, I didn't think it could ever be cleaned up. It was so big that the more I tried, the messier it got, the hole just got deeper and deeper and deeper. But when I got to the point in my life where I just gave up and I said, I I can't fix this. I can't make this work. I can't do anything about this. I can't clean this up. It's not getting any better. When they gave up, when they let go of the wheel, Jesus, take the wheel. When they gave up the wheel, when they took their hands off the controls that they were trying to use to manipulate and control all the outcomes, when they gave up, when they looked up, God showed up and God delivered them as they followed him from their mess. That there are people around you right now. This is, this is our story, right? This is our story. That things were so bad and the mess was so big and God revealed himself to me and he led me out of our mess, that there are people right now who would say, if they had the time to sit, come up here and stand up here and say, tell you their story, if over coffee, if they could tell you their personal story, I know what they would say because I've heard them say it so many times. It's one of the joys of my life and joys of my job. I hear people say all the time, I, I messed up. It got so bad, I gave up. And when I gave up, I looked up. <laughs> and thanks be to God, it was then and there that he showed up. It took the mess to arrange the meeting. And if it hadn't been for the mess in my life, I don't know that I would have ever discovered God for who he is because it, up until the mess in my life, I've heard it, up until the mess in my life, God was just God. God was just a category. God was just a theology. God was just a religion. God was the God of my father. God was the God of my grandmother. God was the church God, the, the Christmas and Easter God. It was the Sunday school God or, or, or the kids camp God or the, 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 the youth group God or the youth camp God. It wasn't very personal. But then I found myself in a mess and I gave up. It was then that I looked up. God showed up. In the midst of my mess, God revealed himself to me in the most personal way imaginable. So here's, here it is. I want to invite you today to do something that is going to be incredibly, incredibly uncomfortable. I want you, I want to invite you, I want to challenge you to personally identify today as a hot mess who is ready to follow Jesus out of and away from your mess. 
In about three minutes, not right now, but in about three minutes, I'm going to invite you to stand up right where you are. Are people going to look around and see? Yep. But I'm still going to ask you to stand up, and here's why. This is so powerful. It's so powerful. The reason you've ever heard of Matthew, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the gospel writer Matthew, the reason you've ever heard of Matthew, the reason there is is even a gospel of Matthew is because one day Jesus was walking along and he came across a tax collector booth. And there was a man there, a young man, his name was Matthew. And everybody knew Matthew, everybody knew who he was, everybody knew what he did. They had talked with him, they'd interacted with him, they knew that he was a mess. And they saw this Jesus who came along and Jesus, in the midst of this crowd, all these people around, Jesus looked at Matthew and said, Matthew, I want you to follow me. And everybody knew Matthew. Everybody in the crowd that could hear knew what Matthew was and knew who he was and knew what kind of a mess he was. And they saw this Jesus. And all of a sudden there's this tension. And Matthew stands up in the midst of this crowd and he follows Jesus to his house. We talked about a man named Zacchaeus last week who was also a tax collector. And one day Jesus was walking along with a crowd and he saw this tax collector up in a tree. And everybody knew Zacchaeus, knew not only his name, but knew who he was, knew what he was. He was a scoundrel. He was a tax collector who had enriched his lives in the backs of other people. He had overtaxed people, overcharged people for their taxes. He was hated. He was despised. And Jesus looks up at that mess of a man, that hot mess of a man in his tree. He says, hey, Zacchaeus, like everybody else around here, I know who you are. I know what you are. And I'm inviting you to come down here and I want you to follow me to your house as the first step of following me for the rest of your life. The woman at the well who we talked about last week, she gets the gold medal. Because right after Jesus spoke with her, she began to realize, could could this be the Messiah? And Jesus didn't ask her to do anything. What she did was she put down something very valuable and precious to her, her water jar. This was a life and death instrument. She put it down and she ran off to her village and she gathered all the village elders together and she said, I just met a man who knows all about me. He knows all about my baggage. He knows all about my past. Just like you, he knows all about the mess that I'm in, the mess that I've made like you. He knows everything about me, but unlike you, he did not condemn me. Could this be the Messiah? Could this be the one that we've been waiting for? She, she identified with Jesus in front of a group of people who had no respect for her and Jesus had not even gotten to the city yet. So if you're willing, and for those of you at home, I'm inviting you to participate as well. If you would say, Scott, you're talking to me. That's me, I, I'm, a, I'm a hot mess. I've made a mess of this area of my life and, and I'm, I'm, I'm right now, I'm ready I'm ready to follow him out of this mess. If he is the light of the world, and even if I can't explain it, if he's willing to embrace me as a mess in the midst of my mess, and he's inviting me to follow him away from my mess, then I'm ready. I'm gonna follow him, and I'm gonna live my life each day discovering what it means to journey with Jesus and discover what he has for my life. And I've already decided that whatever it is he has for me, my answer is yes. So if you're... If you're giving up, if you're looking up, if you're hoping that God's going to show up, I'm going to invite you to stand up right now. Whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever your journey is. Yeah, look at this. Look at this. Look at this. It's beautiful. Beautiful. Look at, look at us hot messes. It's okay. There's no shame. Nothing to be guilty about. You're not alone. I'm going, to ask, I'm going to ask all the hot messes to stand up. Everybody stand up. Because you know what? We're all a mess. And even if you didn't stand up, you're one decision away from being one. So join, <laughs> so join the crew and let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this moment right now where so many have identified as a mess. You know it. They know it. We don't care who knows it. The good news is we don't have to stay here. And even though we, there aren't any magic words we can say, there's no magic prayer we can pray, there's no quick fix, I'm thankful, Father, that you have given us a light, a light that can be followed out. 
And I pray that right now in the name of Jesus that you would give every single person in this room, young and old, no matter where they are, what journey they're in, no matter what's happening or not happening in their life, I pray that you would give them the courage, the courage and the dedication to discover each day what it means to follow you and that God, you would give them the courage and the strength to do what's right, to do what's right, to do what's right, even when it's hard. I pray this in the name of Jesus, amen. Amen, really quickly, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to do just a couple things and then we're gonna go. The first one is this. For those of you who say, okay, I self-identified as a hot mess, what do I do now? It's a great question. What I want you to do today is I want you to go home and I want you to do one of two things. For those of you who are techie people, I want you to get the Bible app. If you don't have it on your phone, I want you to get the Bible app on your phone and there's a little search bar. It's really easy to use. If you don't know how to do it, get your kid to help you or your grandkid to help you, they'll figure it out. But there's a little search feature in there and I want you to search in that, whatever you might be going through, whether it's you're struggling with an addiction, you're in a mess because of finances, you're in a mess in your marriage, you need something about love, relationships, you can type any kind of thing in there and it will bring some scripture to you that you need to take in that will speak to you about where you are. And just begin reading that. And before you read it, remind yourself and remind your heavenly father, my answer is yes, even before I read this. And even though I might not like what it has to say, I've decided that what it says is what I'm gonna do. And I'm gonna follow you out of this because I didn't follow you into this. I'm gonna follow you out. You are the light of the world. The second thing that I want you to do is if somebody, even if you didn't stand, if somebody that you love, if somebody that you care about did stand, Talk to them today. Hey, you stood up. What, what's up? You stood up. What's up? Can we talk about that? And they might not be quick to speak about it, but you can speak to your Heavenly Father about it. Pray for the person that you know and care about who stood up today. And for all of us, come back next week because we're going to continue to talk about this. But be assured, the light of the world is for you and you can follow him out. Let's sing together. God bless. Oh, come behold the works of God, the nations are at his feet. He bends the bow and takes the spear and tells the war to cease. Oh, mighty one of Israel, you are on our side. We walk by faith in God who burns the chariots with fire.
God loves you right where you are, but he loves you too much to leave you there. I hope you heard that this morning. I hope you felt that this morning. I hope as you leave here, you'll download that YouVersion Bible app. I hope you'll have some conversations you need to have. And I hope to see you next week as we continue on in this series. Until then, God bless. Have an amazing week.